And so we've seen a number of different impacts that are very unusual. And people think about bringing water to these communities, but sanitation is often an afterthought. And as a result, you get these secondary waves of um, disease outbreak. But what we're seeing today is a division in the country, not over an issue, but over partisanship. Uh, and both the parties have become much more ideological. Hello and welcome to University Beat. I'm Denise White. A little more than six years ago, on April 20th, 2010, an explosion and fire aboard the Deepwater Horizon oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico set off what some people have called the worst environmental disaster in U.S. history. Eleven workers died. Two days later, the rig sinks and a slick appears on the water as oil spews from the uncapped wellhead. It'll take nearly three months to stop the flow. The accident becomes known as the BP oil spill. The federal government estimates more than 4 million barrels of oil spilled into the Gulf, although BP claims the amount is much lower. Eventually, a federal judge rules BP is responsible for spilling a little more than 3 million barrels. The damage to the Gulf and its inhabitants is still being measured. Among the people trying to determine the damage, then and now, are students and faculty at the College of Marine Science at USF St. Petersburg. Dr. Steve Morawski is a fisheries biologist and marine ecologist and an endowed chair professor of USF St. Pete. He is one of the nation's leading researchers into the BP spill. And Dr. Morawski joins us today. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. First of all, tell me how you became involved in this. Well, my history is a little bit different than most faculty. Um, actually, during the spill, I was working for NOAA, which is a federal agency that was involved in oil spill response. And one of the first things we did was actually t contact the University of South Florida and see if they could mobilize their ship and students and faculty to come out and start collecting information. And so after the spill was over, uh, I talked to President Genshaft and, and uh, the then Dean Bill Hogarth, and they asked me if I would be interested in coming and working at the, at the faculty and, and certainly be in part of the university. And so I've continued my studies of Deepwater Horizon from that. What have you found now, um, since you've been doing this research, about the impact then and now? Well, the impacts extend far and beyond what normally you would consider an oil spill. In this particular case, the oil spill was a mile deep. And so we've seen a number of different impacts that are very unusual as far as oil spill goes. Um, currently, we estimate that about 10% of the oil that came out of that hole rests at the bottom of the, of the Gulf of Mexico a mile deep. Uh, and it probably is going to stay there for a very long time. And then, uh, of course, the, the real impacts that people care about are the impacts on biota. And that is uh, fishes, mammals, sea turtles, and then uh, a, a part of that oil made its way into the salt marshes of Louisiana and, and Mississippi. And so some of that oil is there as well. And so it's impacting on a continuing basis a number of different ecosystems in the Gulf. We're looking at permanent damage to the food chain as well, right? Coming well, in the, well, emanating from that area. Yeah, certainly there's a lot of uh, interaction you know, with the deep water in terms of different types of animals and plants that live there. And one of the ways we're trying to actually make projections about what's gonna happen in the future is there was also a, a, uh, a blowout back in 1979 and 80 in Mexico. And so we've taken our ship this past year down to Mexico to look for traces of that oil spill that happened 37 years ago. And we're able to find it buried on the bottom the same way we find it uh, in Deepwater Horizon. So that gives us a hint that this is going to be around with us for decades. So what's your recommendations on what to do, how to minimize the impact going forward, how to speed up the cleanup of the area? Well, the, the best thing to do is to prevent it in the first place. I mean, uh, in terms of uh, um, the cleanup of, um, of the oil, it's pretty much over. Um, it's very difficult, in fact, impossible to clean the oil out of uh, marshes without doing more damage to those marshes than just letting it weather. And the oil at the bottom of the ocean, uh, we would create more environmental damage trying to mine that oil up as opposed to just let it be buried by natural processes. What do you think we still don't know about the impact of this spill in the Gulf? 
Well, just like Exxon Valdez, it took a, a number of years for the full impacts to reveal themselves. In that case, um, four or five years before the, uh, the herring population, which supported that ecosystem, collapsed. And so we are on the lookout for these kinds of surprises. And it's only going to take time for us to monitor these, these issues to make sure that some of these unforeseen things don't pop up. Almost all the um, researchers that you talk to in the Gulf say that you know we didn't have good baseline data for the what was happening in the Gulf the day before the oil spill. We really have to make that right. Well, what would what difference would baseline data have made? Well, the you know the question in the Gulf is that there's a lot of oil and hydrocarbons in the Gulf. There are natural seeps that you know slowly you know because you're sitting over a huge oil pool. So there's natural seeps that, that bring up oil up into the water. And so um, if you're an oil company, you can basically say, look, it's an oily gulf anyway. Our stuff is not contributing significantly to an oil pollution problem. It's just part of what, what's there. But if you have good baseline, um, you can separate what the impacts of a spill are from all the background that is certainly out there. And that helps in assessing blame which means also fines, those kinds of things. And it basically says when you're done with your drilling activity, put the environment back to where it was when you started. What have we learned from this? With tragedy comes um, some sense of, of trying to put things right. Um, the USF has been in a leadership role you know, for the past six years in terms of uh, doing science related to oil spill uh, and coming up with um, new technologies and new approaches to try to understand this. Uh, the USF people were the first to discover large quantities of oil at the bottom of the ocean. We and our collaborators have come up with new methods to try to look at impacts on the, the deep sea um, critters that live in, in the bottom and also doing high pressure studies. Um, we've also monitored the fish populations to look at contamination. So uh, it's been a tremendous opportunity for the university to make a contribution in something that's really societally important. And so now I think when people think about, you know, where are the schools that you can get a good education in terms of trying to understand the environmental impacts of oil, USF is at the top of that list. Dr. Morawski, thank you so much for joining us on University Beat. A pleasure, thank you. For most Americans, clean drinking water is something we take for granted, but that is not the case in many areas of the world. A USF professor and his students are trying to change that by using cutting-edge technology to turn wastewater into drinking water. And they're doing it half a world away. Mark Schreiner has their story. Work that's being done in an engineering lab at the University of South Florida and outside a school in India could be a game changer when it comes to water purification. It's a cutting-edge device more than a decade in the making known as the new generator. The new and new generator stands for nutrients, energy, and water. So what we have created is a device that can harvest the nutrients, energy, and water from waste, uh, stuff that society discards. The patented machine works through a combination of biotechnology and a membrane separation system. So with the membrane, uh, we are able to separate out the contaminants from the water and recover very clean water from this wastewater. That clean water can then be used in a variety of ways other than for drinking. And we are using that for toilet flushing and also irrigation. But if there's a need for us to uh, convert that to drinking water, we can do that. Uh, it's a matter of optimizing the system and also the economics. Last December, we got a look at the new generator on the USF campus before it was boxed up and shipped almost 10,000 miles away. It was set up near a school in a fishing village in Trivandrum, the capital of the southern Indian state of Kerala. That's where we checked in with Robert Baer, the USF engineering graduate student who's seeing how the system works in real world conditions. So a lot of things happen that you wouldn't expect in a lab. So a few weeks ago we had a few coconuts from a tree fall onto our data logger. And of course not a lot of damage was done, but it wasn't something we expected and we had to rearrange the, the site configuration just so that it wouldn't happen again so we could prevent further damage. The new generator, which is completely solar powered, is being used in conjunction with an e-toilet, India's first electronic public toilet. So that's our primary purpose, is to constantly recycle the water for the e-toilet to, to use and also treat the wastewater that's generated by the e-toilet. Bear adds that it's a bit of a challenge working on his own outside of the lab. We kind of joke that he's sort of like a Martian astronaut, that he's there uh, on Mars and you know back at Mission Control, we're supporting his efforts and giving him what he needs to uh, 
uh, do the field testing. Even while field testing is going on, the team is already looking at other applications for the new generator, including at disaster sites. And people think about bringing water to these communities, but sanitation is often an afterthought. And as a result, you get these secondary waves of um, disease outbreak. So our vision is that we'll be able to deploy these units around the world um, you know, within a very short period after a disaster, and then be able to uh, plug these units in and offer uh, sanitation protection to the people in need. In the development stages, the project drew widespread interest, including financial backing from the country of India and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. With the success of the field testing, that buzz continues to grow, and with it, the possibility of turning the new generator into a mass-produced, marketable product. We're in conversation with a number of people about doing this. Uh, so uh, we would like to manufacture uh, more of the new gens and scale this up, and this is going to happen very quickly because there's a lot of interest that we're drawing. Barrel returned to Tampa this summer to present his Ph.D. dissertation on the new generator. But, he says, he'll never forget the time he spent in India and the effect his team's work had on the people there. In, in our system, every time that I'm, I'm there troubleshooting, we're opening the, the, the device, um, I always have a crowd of at least you know, 15 to 20, 20 people out there always you know, trying, to, trying to look at and see what's going on. It's really fun to see that, that uh, what I'm doing in the community it has a lot of interest by the community members themselves. For University Beat, I'm Mark Schreiner. Bulls football fans can get a jump start on the season. Coach Willie Taggart will be appearing at four kickoff events in Bradenton, Sarasota, Brandon, Tampa, and St. Petersburg. The dates, times, and locations can be found on the athletic department website, GoUSFBulls.com. The Bulls are coming off their first bowl appearance in five years, returning our team record holders at quarterback, running back, and wide receiver, plus seven of their top defensive players. The Bulls opened the 2016 season September 3rd at home against Towson State. For this week in USF history, we go back 11 years on May 20th of 2005. Doctors Kiran and Pallavi Patel pledge $18 million to the university. With state matching funds, the gift is valued at $34.5 million, the largest gift in USF history. The money was used to build the Dr. Kiran C. Patel Center for Global Solutions. Here's the dilemma. A USF student has an idea for business, but how does he or she get started? Where do you get advice, feedback, funding? Until about two and a half years ago, you were pretty much on your own. But now there's the Student Business Incubator, a joint project of USF Connect and the USF Center for Entrepreneurship. Dr. Michael Fountain is the incubator's faculty director. What we want to do is to provide a location for them to work and find and establish the relationships here in the business community and be able to create their vision and execute here in Tampa Bay rather than leaving and going somewhere else. Des Williams was one of the students who worked with Fountain to set up the incubator in the fall of 2013 and was one of the first to apply for admittance. Uh, one of the most important things the incubator does is it aligns you with other successful business people in the community that can actually help you open doors, make contacts, uh, can help you see what next steps should be uh, as far as advancing your concept or your idea forward. Another really, really important thing that the Student Innovation Incubator gives the students is the opportunity to practice their pitch. With feedback and real insight from investors and successful entrepreneurs, it gives you the opportunity to put your concept and your idea through a vetting process that will ultimately make it a lot stronger and a lot more uh, successful in the marketplace having gone through a number of filters provided by other successful entrepreneurs and professors. Uh, it helps, I think, shape the idea in the way that it needs to be in order to be most successful. That's Today, Williams really is the does. CEO of Aquamelon. Aquamelon is a company that manufactures the world's best tasting watermelon juice. We've developed a scalable process here in Central Florida to buy all of the extra watermelons left in the field after harvest season, extract the juice from them, bottle it, and get it to market for athletes and watermelon lovers alike. We've developed partnerships with Florida uh, and Southeastern farmers in order to buy the watermelons left in the field after harvest that uh, aren't quite aesthetically pretty enough to go to market. We buy truckloads of those watermelons, 
We extract the juice using a process where we actually peel the melons, we separate the rind from the red meat, we squeeze that red meat, we take the juice out and we bottle it, and we've developed a number of different product combinations where we add coconut water blends and lime and mint ingredients to create a number of flavor profiles, uh, all made with the antioxidant and electrolyte rich watermelon juice base. Williams says the incubator gave him valuable exposure, not only to business leaders, but also to the news media. I think the other thing that the incubator does, if used smartly, is the incubator is something that a lot of folks like to talk about. Media loves to point at the products of student innovation incubators. So from the standpoint of local news, local television, local newspapers, local magazines, even campus media, the incubator does a great job at giving students a platform to create visibility for their ideas and their concepts. So within one year of having been uh, at retail, we're now looking at chain rollouts and Aquamillan finalized the terms with a uh, Tampa Bay area business tycoon, Dr. Karan Patel, uh, as a capital partner going forward. So we are uh, funded and we are moving toward chain retail within the first year of rollout. So I think business is moving forward in a very healthy way. Williams was an MBA student when he was at USF, but the incubator is not just for business majors. Stephanie Coslow owns an integrated holistic healthcare business. I came into the incubator with a psychology degree, basically. I didn't have business classes or a lot of entrepreneurial experience under my belt, so I came in pretty green. One of the key distinctions that we have here is the juxtaposition of not only the student companies, that are here in the SIR, the Student Innovation Incubator, but the university spin-outs that are just across the hall. And that collaboration, that interaction that takes place on a daily basis, whether it's on a for in a formalized manner or whether it's simply out in the cantina having coffee, talking with another CEO from a, from a university spin-out or the Council of Professionals here at USF Connect. This integration, this um, churning of the cauldron, so to speak, to have that kind of a collaboration. Plus, if you look across the street, where are we? We've got engineering, we've got sciences, just across campus, the medical school. So if, if a student here in the incubator needs additional resources, they don't have to go driving anywhere else. It's here. On a previous edition of University Beat, we introduced you to Dr. Daryl Paulson. Paulson is an emeritus professor of government at USF St. Petersburg. At the time, Paulson talked about the challenges facing presidential candidates Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Today, Paulson looks at the people Trump and Clinton are trying to woo, an electorate that he says is changing. There have been divisions in the country before, but most of those divisions have been over a particular issue. Uh, civil rights during the 1960s, or the Vietnam War during the late 60s and early 70s. Um, or the slavery issue uh, back in the uh, 1860s as well, and the emergence of the Republican Party uh, because of that particular issue. But what we're seeing today is a division in the country not over an issue, but over partisanship. Uh, and both the parties have become much more ideological. It used to be the case 30 or 40 years ago uh, that within the Democratic Party, uh, you could find about a third of the Dem Democratic Party who espoused conservative political views. It used to be the case within the Republican Party. You could find about a third of the Republican Party who would espouse moderate or liberal views on issues. Today, it's almost, within the Republican Party, 100% conservative, and within the Democratic Party, 100% liberal. So those people who wanted the parties to become more ideological, to stand for something, um, have gotten what they wished for. Uh, it used to be the case that people said, there's not a dime's worth of difference between the party. You know, they, they, they both stand for the same thing. Well, that's certainly not the case any longer. They are fundamentally different, and they are fundamentally ideological. Uh, and so the whole notion of compromise, which people say they want, the parties to compromise and get things done, it's almost impossible because neither side is willing to compromise with the other. And it's not just the political parties. It's the voters who are as, as polarized as the parties. 
And uh, you know, Democrat, Democratic voters oftentimes refuse to have anything to do with Republicans, won't listen to a Republican argument, won't exactly turn on a Republican uh, TV program, uh, just as, uh, as Republicans won't listen to the Democratic views on things because they don't believe their position is, is valid. And uh, it's, it's never been so polarized. And we've got to, to get to a point to get beyond that somehow. Well, the moderates are still there, but they're getting trampled by the, by the ideologues. Uh, and it's because the ideologues dominate the political process. We as Americans tend to believe that we're independent, that we listen to all sides, we respect all viewpoints. But in political reality, uh, the political process shows us that that's simply not the case. We're unwilling to listen to differing viewpoints. Uh, and that's going to be a huge problem for the United States that we must get over if we want to move ahead and solve the major problems of the day. USF recently celebrated Arbor Day in a seemingly appropriate way with the planting of a lot of trees. Among them are 73 live oaks, which are part of a project led by senior John Pills. The trees are on Crescent Hill, just north of the Marshall Center. Having lived here on campus and walking everywhere and being in the hot sun, I recognize that there are so many sidewalks that really could use some shade. Students after me, they will benefit from something that I wanted but didn't have, but now they'll have it. They'll have trees that will shade them, and they'll have a better looking campus. It'll take about six months to plant all of the trees. The project includes installation of irrigation systems and will cost about $83,000. The Student Green Energy Fund, which accepts proposals from USF students, is paying for the project. Those new trees join hundreds of others on the Tampa campus. How does the university keep track of them? Our Hedel Gandhi says students are using some new online technology. The canopy of trees surrounding USF's campus provides the perfect backdrop for Arbor Day, a chance for the university to educate the next generation about the importance of planting trees. I first, when I was little, I thought that Arbor Day was something about an armor, like from a knight. But then as I grew, I learned that it was a day to celebrate trees and what, how trees are special. Nine-year-old Mariana Duran and her fellow third graders from Learning Gate Community School joined the USF team to plant two trees on campus. We got to put the dirt in and uh, we raced to see who can, um, do, um, like which side could do it first. All my classmates like, sh used a shovel and it was pretty, pretty heavy and we had to like put it around the tree. The students shared their own love for trees. Some trees are short, some trees are tall, but all trees are lovely as their leaves change in the fall. They also learned the importance of saving one of our most precious resources. Without trees, then there would be like no bird, like birds wouldn't have a nest to live in, or they, or um, a bunch of animals wouldn't have habitat. It helps like birds and squirrels and lizards. And, um, and animals in the nature. And spreading that message goes beyond Arbor Day. We've mapped over 3,000 of the trees on this campus uh, over the last four months. It's part of the Tampa Tree Map, a web-based map and database that allows anyone to track trees in the city of Tampa and on the USF campus. I did not know that. But when I heard that, I'm like, that's cool. USF senior Keir Hamilton shows us how it works. Okay, so to map trees on the USF campus, we uh, use a DBH tape, which is uh, very handy for finding our circumference of the tree. They use this like device thing that um like that um waypoints the the tree spot, so that um if they look on a compass, they can find the place where they um waypoint. So right now, I'm going to add this laurel oak into Tampa Tree Map. To map the tree, I'm going to first add a location. All the information about the tree goes into the app that's linked to the public database. It's all done through a smartphone. I'm going to enter in the diameter of the tree. The tree's height is also part of the profile. It's a very tall tree, 48 feet tall. And also we're going to take a picture and set the species of the tree. 
The final step, snapping a photo of the tree to upload to a database accessible to anyone in the world. There we are. An easy way to capture the beauty and significance of these trees. So they can check on the tree to see if it's healthy. And you know, trees are particularly important for us. They're particularly important on a college campus because it gives shade and it's beauty and it adds warmth. But it also is doing a lot of work around the world on the atmosphere. And that was the message these kids took home from Arbor Day at USF. I learned so many things and that I learned that planting trees is actually fun. How they see a tree and all the different things a tree means to them and their enthusiasm for planting and being stewards of this planet in the future gives us all hope. It gives us all inspiration. We all had big smiles on our face. It was a happy day. For University Beat, I'm Hedel Gandhi. If there's a story about the University of South Florida you'd like to see us cover, please let us know. Our email is ubeat at wusf.org. Our website is universitybeattv.org. We are also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find us by searching University Beat TV. And that's another edition of University Beat. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Denise White.